And good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us for the NAST Collaborative Community discussion of uh, UDIs and emerging issues related to UDIs. My name is Sandy Siami. I am the Senior Vice President of the Medical Device Innovation Consortium and lead the National Evaluation System for Health Technology, or NEST, as you are hearing. Um, just a little bit about our agenda today. Uh, I'll kick off this meeting. Uh, just a couple of words about MDIC and NEST for those who may not be familiar uh, with either. Um, and then we'll hear a little bit about the significance of collaborative communities in general and take a deeper dive into the NEST collaborative community and discuss uh, with what I am so excited for is our inaugural project within the collaborative community. Um, I'm hoping that we will have an interactive panel discussion afterwards, so please do um, participate. Uh, next slide, please. So NEST is an independent coordinating center uh, that was established by the FDA. Um, our goal is to drive quality and efficiency in the use of real world data to inform medical device development and evaluation. And we are one of the first FDA recognized collaborative communities, which is why we're, we're here today. Our mission is to catalyze the timely, reliable, and cost-effectiveness development of, of real-world evidence to enhance regulatory and clinical decision-making, as well as reimbursement or coverage decision-making. And our vision, again, is to be the leading organization within the health technology and medical device ecosystem for conducting these efficient, timely, high-quality uh, studies throughout the total product life cycle. Next slide. Just a brief kind of history of how NEST came about. Um, FDA had proposed a national um, evaluation system back in 2012. It became a reality in 2016 when MDIC was actually awarded funding for NEST. Uh, over the next uh, couple of years, we established our infrastructure, we established our research network or collaborators that are going to provide different um, sources of real world data, whether that be claims data or electronic health record data, pharmacy uh, or uh, pharmacy data, claims public or private, as well as registry data. We even have supplemental information such as billing uh, data and genomics. So this is has been quite exciting as we characterize our network. We also initiated a data quality subcommittee as well as a research method subcommittee because it's important to lay the groundwork of what these real world data studies are gonna look like for generating different types of real world evidence and the quality of that. You might've heard fit for purpose, fit for use kind of data. And that's what we're trying to get at. In 2019, we were recognized as um, uh, by FDA as uh, a collaborative uh, community. And you'll see in 2020, we've really hit the ground running. We've started to see the fruits of our labor, so to speak. Our initial frameworks have been developed, which I'll talk about in just a moment. We've launched Nest 1.0. Again, I'll talk about in a moment. We're expanding our, our networks and soon to come active surveillance. Next slide. As I mentioned, we have two important efforts uh, for NEST to advance the use of real world data to generate real world evidence. Our research methods framework provides the guidelines for the design and conduct of using real world data in research. Our data quality framework provides the guidance and the framework for generating, capturing, extracting, high quality data within and from electronic health records. Certainly I mentioned there's other types of real world data, so our next iteration will be broader. Next slide. 
And finally, uh, as I mentioned, as NEST has matured and is continuing to mature, we have three additional initiatives. The first one is what we have dubbed NEST 1.0. This is where we can conduct research studies for regulatory clinical coverage decision making to the broader community outside of the pilot cases that we've executed that basically stress test that real world data. Our active surveillance, <clears throat> excuse me, where we're establishing our cloud infrastructure to host the various sources of data for devices in order to monitor medical device safety, safety signals, and using the defined methodologies. And finally, our collaborative community that was one of the first to be recognized by the FDA. I have the great privilege to now introduce Dr. Daniel Canios, who is the Director of the Office of Clinical Evidence and Analysis within the Office of Product Evaluation Quality at the Centers for Device and Radiological Health, or CDRH as we all know it. He's going to talk a little bit about the significance of collaborative communities to the medical device and health technology ecosystem. Daniel, over to you. Thank you, Sandy. It's really great to be joining everyone today as part of this collaborative community, which is taking on such a very important issue. Um, I'll be writing uh, just some brief comments on CDRH's perspective uh, on, on the significance of collaborative communities, and in particular as it pertains to leveraging uh, unique device identifiers to use evidence from, from clinical experience for regulatory decision making. So the purpose of public communities is to, to bring together uh, the medical device stakeholders in a continuing form of uh, private and public sector, sector uh, members, including the FDA, to achieve common outcomes and solve shared challenges, uh, leveraging collective opportunities. Uh, CDH believes that collaborative communities can contribute to improvements in areas affecting patients and healthcare in the United States. Accordingly, uh, participation in collaborative communities is, was one of CDRH's strategic priorities in 2018-2020. These communities can um, contribute to improvements in important areas affecting U.S. patients and, and healthcare. In addition, FDA uh, participation in this collaborative communities uh, aim to help advance the agency's goals of ensuring that patients in the United States ultimately have access to high quality, safe, and effective medical devices of public health importance, first in world. CDRH is participating as a member of collaborative community, uh, but does not establish, lead, or, or operate the collaborative communities. And as Sandy mentioned, uh, September of last year, CDRH recognized the, the NAS Coordinating Center as a collaborative community. It's exciting that this NEST uh, collaborative community will be taking on the challenge of evaluating the uptake of UDIs by health systems and health plans and characterizing the UDI adoption and use and assessing associated barriers and facilitators of the implementation. Consistency and reliability of medical device identification is a key component for building out a robust system for collecting evidence from clinical experience inform regulatory decision making. The FDA established the unique device identification system to adequately identify medical devices sold in the United States from manufacturers uh, through distribution to patient use. Uh, the UDI final rule requires device labelers uh, to include UDI on uh, device labels and packages except where the rule provides for exceptions or alternatives. And they also must submit device information to the Global Unique Device Identification Database, or good ID. As shown here, uh, UDI is a unique uh, numeric or alphanumeric code that generally consists of the device identifier uh, mandatory fixed portion of the UDI that identifies a labor, labeler and specific versions or model of the device and uh, product identification, a product, product production identifier. Um, a conditional variable portion of the UAI, which can identify lot or 
batch number, uh, serial number, expiration date, uh, date of manufacture, and distinction, uh, distinct identification codes. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, device labelers are required to submit information to the FDA uh, administered good ID. Uh, uh, this good ID includes a standard set of uh, basic identifying elements for each device with UDI and contains only the device identifier uh, DI, which serves as the key to obtain device information in this database. Um, however, uh, good ID does not include the production identifier. Next slide, please. Uh, one more, please. Great, thank you. Uh, and shown here are just some examples of where FDA is um, already engaged uh, with uh, the uh, UDI incorporation to um, to uh, leverage uh, that for uh, that evidence from a clinical experience. And this collaborative work includes um, efforts led by Mercy, uh, the building UDI into longitudinal data for surveillance, or the Build Initiative, uh, which aims to expand the UDI work to distributed data networks develop a build common data model and accumulate learnings and UDI implementation within registries. Additionally, with uh, HHS Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Trust Fund support, FDA is furthering UDI implementation and, and coordinated registry networks and to advance the CRN capacities for executing patient-centered outcomes research, really helping us harness the, the power of that evidence from clinical experience with uh, consistent and reliable identify viable information for medical uh, devices. And uh, one of the test cases uh, for NEST, the feasibility of using real-world data and the evaluation of cardiac ablation catheters led by Mercy, Yale, and Mayo, um, is also assessing uh, the use of UDI uh, as it looks at uh, RWD from EHRs and assessing whether they can be fit for purpose for regulatory submissions. Uh, supporting potential studies for labeling expansion in the areas of cardiac ablation on patients with persistent AF and VT. These are just uh, a few examples of where uh, FDA is actively engaged with the uh, community to uh, really leverage uh, UDI for that RWE evaluation. And lessons that learned from these uh, can be really rolled into the effort uh, of this group as we work to address this challenge. Next slide, please. So I look forward to the panel discussion today and the next steps for addressing UDI challenges within this collaborative community. Thank you. Daniel, thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, we're so grateful you joined us today and we're really appreciative um, for your remarks. You've set a really high bar for us for collaborative communities and we're working hard to live up to that. So thank you for supporting us. I'm April Young, and I have the privilege to serve as the coordinator of the NEST Collaborative Community. And I want to echo everyone's appreciation to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's, it's an exciting time for our collaborative community, working with uh, great stakeholders uh, as we have a chance to on an issue that's as critical and complex as unique device identifiers. As you've heard, uh, you know, the collaborative community brings to NEST a forum for collective action on issues of great importance to the medical device ecosystem. We're focusing here today on UDI, but we have the capacity to tackle other pressing problems using a collaborative kind of action-oriented think tank approach, which we think is exciting. Next slide. Uh, we've been building our collaborative community for just over a year now, as Sandy mentioned, following uh, closely the guidelines that are outlined in the FDA Collaborative Communities Toolkit. Um, we see this as not a static process, but really an ongoing process in which we're refining our objectives, refining stakeholder roles, and you know, decision-making approaches um, uh, to the tasks and problems at hand while we adhere to the essentials like transparency, communication, evaluation of impact. Next slide, please. Um, here we want to draw attention to what we know, and uh, it's at the core of who we are and what we do as a collaborative community. While our stakeholder groups vary, as you can see, our interests 
really do not. Whether we identify with the payer community, with healthcare systems, whether we're patients, regulators, device manufacturers, IT and data solutions providers, uh, healthcare providers, or researchers, we really do all share a commitment to performance and effectiveness. As you can see inside the blue circle there, better patient outcomes, better uh, clinical decision making, improved data quality, efficient review, and above all, safety. And so an awareness of this shared commitment and these common interests uh, is really at the heart of all that we do. We build our working groups and we identify and tackle challenges being very sharply focused on these points of convergence. Next slide, please. The fact that you've joined us today, uh, we really hope means that you're interested in becoming involved with Nest Collaborative Community if you haven't already uh, signed up and gotten involved. Please, become, please consider becoming a member and um, it's free to do that on our webpage. Um, as we said, our inaugural uh, initiative is focused on UDI. You'll hear momentarily about our UDI adoption and application research study. Coming up, Sanket is gonna to talk to us about that. We're also seeking nominees for the working group, the UDI advisory working group that will support and inform that research project. So that's yet another way to get involved. The research team um, who will be working on that will produce a UDI implementation roadmap that will be based on their findings from that research. And there will be a, an opportunity for uh, community to comment on that. So community comment, that will be another opportunity to get involved. And we'll also reach out to you. Uh, so look for us sometime in the early part of the coming year to solicit your ideas for other issues that you'd like to see NEST collaborative community tackle. Next slide, please. So we've selected uh, UDI as our first issue for several reasons. One might, might ask, why UDI, why now? Um, we certainly recognize that there's growth and fur further globalization in the medical device market. Um, also the need to have data management capabilities that keep pace with that growth and also um, with the urgency that's there to monitor and troubleshoot issues of supply. Um, we also see that the progress uh, when we look on systems interoperability, post-market surveillance, issues like this pre-market assessment have really slowed over the last decade or so. And we, if we look, we're not quite where we might have wanted to be. We might have hoped to be at this point. So again, a good reason for us to jump into this as a collaborative community. And also uh, in no small measure due to COVID-19, uh, the supply chain is a priority and it's not just in the U.S., but around the world. And this is very much uh, on, the, on the world stage. And so we are hoping that that translates into a kind of motivation um, uh, and will for the policy change, the type of policy change that we need to see um, that'll help us all as stakeholders kind of lean into this system-wide interoperability that we've really been dreaming about for so many years. Next slide, please. We uh, think our collaborative community is uniquely positioned to make a contribution to this issue because of our commitment to that multi-stakeholder approach. Again, um, we know what we don't know, and we know it's important to bring all sectors, all players around the table to ensure that we have solutions that are then very much cognizant of the interests and the operations across the system. We're also, uh, we wanna take advantage of our adjacency to industry. We know that at, at NEST we have that and that can mean leverage. And we are committed to leveraging that uh, for the benefit of this issue. Um, device manufacturers certainly need a voice in the strategies and actions related to product documentation and monitoring. And um, we want to in, both enable and build on that, that commitment. Um, we're also committed to uh, regulatory considerations really being a pivotal part of solution development, both in terms of operations and policy. And we think, again, the, the ability to bring all of that together, we're very excited about. So uh, next slide, please. Um, 
So we're just touching on this work at a, a high level here today, and I want to invite you again to, to learn more and get more involved. So please sign up and join the Nest Collaborative community. Um, apply yourself or nominate someone for the UDI Advisory Working Group, and please do keep in touch with us via social media. Another one of the things I'm charged to do today is to really try to keep us moving and on time uh, toward our, our, our panel and so forth. So I'm going to turn it over to Sanket, um, Dr. Sanket Druva from the research team that is conducting, again, that UDI adoption and application study. Sanket is from the University of California, uh, the San Francisco School of Medicine, and he's a bit here to tell you a bit more about the research project. Over to you, Sanket, and thank you so very much again. Thanks to you all for taking the time to learn about our research project, which is uh, about to get underway. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, I'm delighted to share our research study entitled Evaluation of Unique Device Identifier Adoption by Health Systems on behalf of our investigator team of Dr. Neelay Shah at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Joe Ross at Yale School of Medicine, Dr. Joe Drazda at Mercy Health, and Dr. Natalia Wilson at Arizona State University. The next slide, please. The background, as we've discussed, um, Daniel and April, the 2013 UDI final rule required that each medical device contain a distinct code on its label, packaging, and sometimes on the device itself. The UDI presents an enormous opportunity and enhances our ability to generate high quality, real world evidence for regulated medical devices, including post-market evaluations of safety and effectiveness. Next slide, please. Prior research has examined, uh, as Daniel mentioned, the availability of the UDI. Um, a large research study entitled the BUILD Initiative, Building the UDI into Longitudinal Data for Medical Device Evaluation, led by Drs. Drazda and Wilson, found that UDIs are not routinely collected in existing electronic health record or other ancillary data systems for most health systems such as not being available in surgical information systems, as well as the electronic health record. Even when the UDIs are available because they're collected, they tend to be in very limited clinical care settings, such as, for example, only in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. This means that there is a massive, relatively unfulfilled opportunity for evidence generation about medical devices using the unique device identifier, if we can integrate it into our electronic data sources. To the next slide, please. So the objective of our team's research study is to characterize UDI adoption and use, including identification of the barriers and facilitators through site visits and key informant interviews to all Nest CC network collaborating health systems, as well as a separate survey of a random sample of US health systems of varying sizes and locations related to these same issues. So first, a bit more of an in-depth view of the UDI at NestCC Data Network Collaborating Health Systems, and then a larger overview um, of more targeted questions. And we'll dive into these in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. So in our first aim, we intend to conduct semi-structured key informant interviews during site visits and the individuals with whom we hope to meet or plan to meet at these, uh, for these interviews include the NEST data network lead, as well as leadership in hospital supply chain, information technology, as well as research on medical devices. We intend to ask about a variety of domains related to the UDI, including about the adoption and use of the UDI in various clinical areas, and the current processes for tracking medical devices, whether using the UDI or not. We also seek to understand these individuals' understanding of the benefits of the UDI's availability, as, where, as well as barriers and facilitators, and those may be, and likely will be, administrative, financial, and organizational. So really seek to obtain a real in-depth understanding through this aim. To the next slide. In our second aim, we intend to collect, collect, conduct an electronic survey. Our target population here is US health system quality and performance leadership. 
Our goal in this survey is to characterize whether, how, and for what clinical areas that the UDIs are collected within each health system's electronic data sources. In addition, on the next slide, uh, in, as part of the same, we intend to conduct very targeted interviews that are semi-structured, either teleconference or video conference, that are focused on the importance of the UDI and efforts to support integration. We specifically plan to meet with leadership at private and public payers. We intend these conversations to focus primarily on claims, as well as leadership at professional societies, electronic health record vendors, and enterprise resource planning vendors, again, to understand um, and ask about the importance of the UDI and ways to support integration into electronic data sources. In terms of dissemination on the next slide, we plan at least two peer-reviewed manuscripts, one related to AIM-1 and one related to AIM-2 at a minimum. We also intend to um, be a part of a UDI public meeting and at this point, in approximately late 2022, we intend to publish a UDI integration roadmap based on our learnings and feedback uh, over the coming years. Thanks again for the opportunity to present and share our work and for taking the time uh, on behalf of our investigator team. Delighted to share this work and we'll pass it on to the uh, panel. Thank you, Sanket. Um, we're so excited about this research project and we really appreciate your overview today. Um, as Sanket said, they're getting off the ground next month and we will be providing more information over the next several weeks. Um, I'm Alexandra Cha um, and I support strategic operations for NEST and I have the privilege to introduce the final segment of our meeting today. Um, and I'm sure you've been looking forward to, it's our live panel. Um, our panel of UDI experts come from across the medical device ecosystem and are all voices on the issue and perhaps more importantly, they are dealing with how to incorporate UDIs into their enterprises. Moderating today will be Terry Reed, Director of Partner Relationships at Symmetric Health Solutions. Terry is a health informatics professional who has spent the past decade advocating for safer, better functioning medical device ecosystem. Prior to Symmetric, she served as FDA's Associate Director of Informatics, where she managed the development of Global Unique Device Identifier Identification Database, or Good Idea, ID, promoted unique device identifier adoption across stakeholders of the medical device ecosystem. We are so grateful to Terry and the panelists for joining today. And I want to give the participants two um, important notes. There's a chat area where you can now access bios of the panelists and discussants. And I also encourage all of you, and some of you have already taken advantage of this, to make use of the Q&A button. <clears throat> you may submit questions and comments for the panelists. We'll be drawing from these um, during the conversation to shape our discussion. And I'll turn it over now to Terry. Thank you so much, Alexandra. I'm going to go through um, our panelists, uh, just go through who they are and where they work. Um, as Alexandra mentioned, um, a full bio for each of them is in the comments, so please go out and review those. Erin Quincer uh, is joining us from the FDA, where she's a regulatory health scientist in the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation in the Division of Technology and Data Services. Chris Muir comes to us from the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT, where he is the Director of the Standards Division at the Office of National Coordinator. Mike Schiller is, works at the Association for Healthcare Resources and Materials Management, which is a part of the American Hospital Association and has been a sponsor of a learning UDI community. He's the Senior Director of Supply Chain. Dennis Black is from Becton Dixon and Company, where he is a UDI program director. And Rich Kusera is filling in for Matt Stone, who um, and will be giving a provider point of view. He is the CEO of Symmetric Health Solutions. We are also very fortunate to have three discussants who will represent uh, patient perspective. 
Um, that is Richard Embry, Dr. Richard Embry, from, who is medical director at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama. Angie Bato Van Bemden, who is the president and CEO of the Muscular Skeletal Research International. And Hugo Campus, who works in the All of Us Research Program and is part of the California Precision Medicine Consortium. On July 23rd, 2018, Pepperidge Farms recalled 3 million packages of goldfish crackers. Two days later, my neighbor in Hickory, North Carolina was notified through an alert on her cell phone that she had purchased those crackers at Walmart. Similarly, I can move addresses, even states, and recall notices describing specific problems and actions to take with that car will arrive in my mailbox because the car's VIN number is linked to my auto registration. UDI is meant to play a similar role for medical devices. That is to provide the ability to link a device to the patient or provider that pays for and uses the device. The resulting benefits include better monitoring of device safety and patient outcomes, as well as improved ability to notify patients of recalled and problematic devices. So as has been mentioned by Daniel and others, there, it's been five years uh, before that recall. So in September of 2013, the UDI system was born in the United States. It's currently seven years old, so it's mature enough to make its presence known, as we all know with uh, seven-year-olds, but it's still dependent on a village or a community like this to attain its originally intended benefit. Today, our expert panel is going to be identifying emerging issues impacting UDI adoption across the represented stakeholder groups. We'll hear from the FDA and a manufacturer that has established the foundation for UDI, the supply chain leaders that are attempting to implement it, Office of National Coordinator who's working with clinicians and patients concerned about UDI to support clinical decision-making and care. Then I look forward here now to a lively discussion uh, that will include questions from the audience, so please uh, add your questions, as was mentioned before. And what we're going to do is have each of the panelists, and I will call up on them, to present for two or three minutes what they see as the current emerging issues from the perspective of their organization. So we're going to start with Erin Quintzer, who, uh, again, reminder, is from the FDA CDRH. Erin? Thank you, Terry. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to participate in MDIC's NEST Collaborative Community Discussion, and my apologies for the technical difficulties, but my video is not working. <laughs> so for FDA, um, fully realizing the benefits of the unique device identification system depends on UDI being integrated into data sources throughout our healthcare system. This includes the supply chain, electronic health records, and registries. This, however, requires UDI data to be of a high quality, such that all stakeholders in the healthcare community have sufficient confidence in the accuracy and the completeness of the data. FDA continues to work with labelers on the implementation of UDI requirements, and we are working on both policy and technical items to help ensure the quality and utility of UDI data. We believe it's important to continue focusing our resources on addressing implementation issues and data quality, especially for higher risk devices. So in addition to working with industry on implementation, we have also worked internationally with other regulators. Most recently, we were involved in the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, also known as IMBRF, where they had a UDI working group which included 10 jurisdictions, as well as stakeholders. As a result of these meetings with IMDRF, IMDRF produced three documents posted in March of 2019. These documents included a UDI system application guide to assist the stakeholders within healthcare to better understand their role and impact in the UDI system. And this guide also provided details and specifications necessary to ensure consistency for enabling a harmonized approach to UDI. 
IMDRF also came out with a document comparing the use of UDI data elements across different IMDRF jurisdictions. And we also produced a document containing selected use cases for system requirements related to UDI and healthcare, including examples of UDI data and electronic health records, adverse event reporting, and UDI and medical device registries. So we look forward to continuing our work and our collaborations for UDA implementation and adoption. Thank you, Erin. Uh, now we'll get a, a manufacturer perspective. Uh, Dennis, would you like to take uh, some time to talk about that? Sure. I know that all of you are familiar with the FDA's UDI regulation. What you may not know is that we have a number of other regulations that we're working through globally for UDI. We're working through implementation in Europe, in China, in South Korea, and Turkey. And we have some other requirements related to UDI data in the Netherlands. And then we also have some commercial requirements in the UAE, the UK, and even with PEPFAR initiative in the developing world. And we have a list of countries that we're expecting to release UDI regulations and get started on in the near future. And that includes India and Saudi Arabia and Australia. And we know the list will continue to grow. And while generally these regulations are harmonized, there are in fact some differences. Through this process, we've come to appreciate that the US FDA has provided us with a help desk and releases guidance documents and gives us an updated data dictionary as some of the requirements change. We find this to be helpful. While these regulations are generally harmonized, there are in fact some differences. And I think this is something that we're gonna to have to pay attention to in years to come. If we think about having different data definitions, it seems as though we would be able to describe a product the same way in the US and Europe and use the same clinically relevant size information, where in fact we, we can't. There are some instances where we will have to describe a product different and use different indicators for size in one country versus another. And this is complex for us to maintain. It's also complex for researchers to understand why we've chosen to describe a product differently in different parts of the world. There are different rules around when we have to change a device identifier. And we understand the importance of this for clinicians. And I think the US came up with a pretty reasonable set of requirements. And if we look at this around the world, we have a really pretty difficult list of requirements for when we need to change device identifiers. And I think this is something that we're gonna to have to sort through. It'll be a difficult conversation with the clinician when we have to explain that we've chosen to change the device identifier because we've removed a language from a label in Europe. And I just things like that that we're going to have to kind of think through as we as we move forward. And then even if we look at some of the things around labeling, where we might have to describe software one way in the U.S. and another way in the rest of the world. So we are seeing increased requirements, and I think this is something that we're going to have to pay attention to and manage going forward so that UDI becomes useful in the way that Terry described at the beginning of the discussion. Thank you. So let's go to um, a supply chain perspective. Mike, um, as a, a lead of the uh, learning UDI community, can you share some emerging issues from your perspective? Happy to. Thank you, uh, Terry and April. Uh, really a privilege to be a part of this uh, meeting today in the panel discussion. So there are, there are a couple of key issues that um, are creating the adoption issues within the healthcare setting. First and foremost, I think it's culture, right? We need to overcome the, some of the cultural environments that exist within the procedural settings as well as the acute care and non-acute care settings. We also have to look at, at health IT. I think uh, a significant hurdle is the lack of scanning technology that's in place today or some of the dated nature of the scanning technology. By that, I mean you've got scanners that can read just linear barcodes as opposed to the stack barcodes or even the 2D barcodes. And uh, I think we need to, we need to consider a, a program similar to that of the EHR where there were subsidies that were put forward for hospitals to go ahead and implement the EHR. So we've got this fantastic infrastructure in place now with EHRs throughout the US healthcare system. We really don't have any scanning technology to go ahead and incorporate and make it easy to adopt and consume the UDI. So perhaps a similar program to subsidize scanning technology to uh, be able to clear that cost hurdle that hospitals are looking at to implement scanning technology. I think we also need to think about interoperability. Uh, 
it, within an OR setting, it's it, you really do not want to go ahead and introduce yet another system for the OR clinicians to learn. So it really needs to be seamless. It needs to be incorporated into their current clinical care processes. And we need to have the seamless transfer of that information. At the end of the day, we really need to be able to get that information into the EMR so that it can move downstream into the registries and into claims forms to provide the post-market surveillance that we all are looking for. And certainly one of the big benefits of the UDI. Lastly, I'd say some additional emergence, emerging issues have come about as a result of COVID. And those would be the lack of transparency, uh, utilization, data analytics, and the ability to effectively and efficiently identify recalls, patients affected by the products, as well as the products in the location so that we can remove those from the shelves. And if you look at each one of those emerging issues, the UDI is a common denominator to moving each of these forward and achieving the results that we hope to achieve in transparency, utilization, data, and efficient recall processes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, Rich, uh, also from a supply chain and a provider perspective, um, what kinds of emer emerging issues are you running into? Thank you, Jerry. I, uh, I could talk for quite a while about uh, uh, the different hurdles and uh, challenges hospitals are, are overcoming uh, to really fully implement UDI. Um, one thing I'd like to, to say is that <clears throat> Everywhere from rural community health systems, large multi-state IDMs are really looking at UDI um, right now as a global source of truth as it pertains to uh, the supplies that they procure uh, throughout the supply chain into clinical operations. Uh, so concepts like the item master and the ERP. Um, everyone is starting with first and foremost that item master and feeding into uh, their other clinical systems like the EHR and downstream into uh, other billing systems, many of which um, have not talked, spoken well with one another prior. Uh, and that really comes down to having uh, accurate identifiers to each of these items. Um, so looking at the uh, good ID and UDI globally, um, Hospitals want to build this out as a transparent source of truth for maintaining this information accurately. Moving into that, uh, the, some of the emerging issues uh, with building an item master this way have been obviously some of the duplicates, GTINs, and UDIDIs uh, that, that we spoke about. Um, labeling standard issues, um, seeing things like HIBIC encoded into GS1 barcodes. Uh, th these types of issues cause problems in process flows. And, and really to elaborate on that uh, is gaps in um, regulations. A, a big example being um, human donated products, such as graphs reporting or falling under CBER regulations, which are different than the CDRH. Uh, to a hospital, these items are implants uh, and they're, they're not different. Um, but when you're building a system and they don't have a UDIDI, it becomes difficult um, to make exceptions for certain types of items and not others. Last but not least in our panel is Chris Muir from the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT. We've talked a lot about uh, the hospitals uh, starting to implement UDI, I think in part because of ONC requirements. So Chris, maybe you could uh, share with us what you see as emerging issues from your perspective. Yeah, no, thank you very much. So part of what ONC does is write regulation to advance our policy goals, such as patient care coordination, patient safety, patient access to their health data, and reducing provider burden, among other goals. And then we implement these through ONC's Health Information Technology um, Certification Program. So most of the electronic health record systems used in doctor's offices and, and, and in hospitals are certified through ONC's program. Um, specifically, um, including the UDI and certification ensures information about implantable devices can be captured, recorded, and used, and exchanged in a standardized machine-readable manner. Um, for example, certified electronic health records must share information um, in um, human and machine-readable formats using the HL7 consolidated CDA standard, and UDI is part of that standard. Um, another example is that um, certified technology 
must also share the UDI for implantable devices through the use of standardized APIs or application programming um, interfaces, which gives patients and providers access to information contained in the electronic health record through third party apps. And so the, the bottom line is that the UDI inclusion and certification is aimed at delivering information to clinicians so that they can know what devices their patients have implemented, whether or not those devices are active and are able to use that information to deliver safer, and more um, effective care. And, um, and I could go on, but um, I, I think we want to have kind of a dialogue and, and we could probably yeah. hit more on the issues. Thank you so much. Um, and to go on, uh, we have three discussions, Rich, Hugo, and Angie. We thought we'd start with Hugo. Um, Hugo, to, to share your reaction to some of these emerging issues and your particular concerns with UDI. Thank you, Terry. Um, yeah, this is, this is really interesting and, and, and really important as uh, uh, as, as um, uh, just to say a little bit about about me and why, why I'm here, it's I'm a resident of California. I'm part of, as Terry mentioned, I'm part of the uh, the Stanford Medicine X uh, patient uh, advisor group and part of the All of Us research program, uh, which is being executed by the California Precision Medicine. Uh, uh, group here or consortium in California. But what you might not know about me is that uh, I am also a patient living with an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. And I've had the device for uh, a number of devices on, on for, for many years. Uh, to me, uh, there are a couple of things that kind of stand out as being particularly important um, for successful implementation of, uh, of, of, of UDI. Number one, it's, it's clear to me that uh, UD, it's, it's fundamental that the UDI is recorded in the electronic health record there and, and linked to the patient record. There isn't really a way for us to deliver value to patients if, uh, if uh, the UDI is not uh, recorded in the electronic health record. That's, that's to me, sort of a, a, a very basic and critical uh, uh, step. The, the other part of it uh, is, is the fact that I think uh, it's about public engagement and, and patient engagement. Uh, it really has to do with making sure that people realize the value uh, of, uh, of UDI and why they should care and why, why uh, it matters to them. And, and, uh, and there's, there are a couple of mentions, I think uh, Mike may have mentioned uh, transparency of a few, a few of the panelists uh, brought, the, uh, brought this up. And, and it's particularly important to me in a sense that uh, it creates, I think, this, this, this point about engagement creates an opportunity for us to increase transparency and reestablish um, some of the trust that's been lost uh, over the years as we, as we, uh, uh, as the UDI perhaps in, uh, may enable uh, better ways for, for us to stay in touch with patients, with inform, informing patients of advisories, informing patients of, of recalls. And uh, it's, it's a real opportunity and it's really important step there. Uh, so my questions, I suppose, are, you know, uh, you know how in in addition to sort of creating a engagement from an opportunity of uh, that, that arises from communicating uh, advisories and recalls uh i think are there any other uh, engagement opportunities uh, to bring patients into the fray and the conversation uh so that people can see value in in udi implementation and the other part of my question is um what's the what's the vision uh that that we have or we should have for patients to access uh, UDI data. Thank you. Um, Rich Embry, um, do you have reactions to what you guys saying there? Sure. I think that uh, the entire system is pushing uh, towards transparency for, for patients. Uh, and as an insurance carrier, we, uh, Blue Cross encourages that. We know that uh, members who are engaged in their own care have much better outcomes. Uh, I think UDI could be part of that, uh, allowing uh, members to have uh, access to the absolute highest level of information regarding 
their care, uh, potentially a device that has been implanted uh, within their body. So uh, we as an insurance carrier encourage it. Uh, we struggle, as many do, with the cost of implementing uh, UDI tracking, including it in claims. Uh, so uh, not sure from our perspective whether there's going to require a regulatory mandate to do it or as it was with EHR, uh, a financial incentive to do it. Uh, the other thing to, to put out there is insurance companies like Blue Cross are increasingly being held responsible and looked to by their customers, large groups, to manage the long-term care of their, of their members, of their employees. Um, people change insurance carriers much less frequently than they change uh, physicians and mm -hmm. hospitals. And as they move around, oftentimes their information can be lost. So using the uh, UDI to track uh, data longitudinally, uh, potentially as part of research, but also for chronic care management for some of our members is something that I think insurers and health plans really are excited about doing. Keith, um, what is your reaction um, to, to what you've heard so far from your perspective? Effective, uh, as a patient advocate and a clinician. Oh, yep. Well, just, um, you know, complementing what Hugo and Richard just mentioned, you know, with the recalls and then the long-term data. Um, I, I think with the recalls, Terry, like you said in the beginning, Pepperidge Farm can go ahead and alert the buyer of their um, goldfish. Why can't we alert patients when there is a recall or there's a change in the safety profile or um, risk-benefit assessment for particular um, devices? It, it definitely, of course, patients have to have access, but I, I think it would be ideal to go beyond that and make sure patients are alerted when there's, um, you know, a change in their risk benefit profile. Uh, just thinking about the rural patients or so, or those that really have to drive a distance, you know, to get to their healthcare provider that don't see their healthcare provider until it's absolutely necessary and there's been some emergency or so. Um, they need to be alerted that there's a recall and there are decisions to be made with their healthcare team if you know, it's safer to go ahead and just monitor the device or if it would be better to have it replaced. Um, so if the, if the conversation could just, you know, ensure patient inclusion and partnership here with, you know, finding the best, um, best method for alerting the patients and all when there are changes in the safety profile. Um, and then again, like uh, Richard was saying, beyond the recall data, the longitudinal data. Just the opportunity here, I think, is huge for the longitudinal data that could be collected, real-world data that could be applied for real-world evidence, post-market surveillance. And then I had heard earlier in the conversation, the active surveillance um, working group, uh, I believe they have that initiative going. But this would be ideal because you need to, um, in my opinion, the product should be, a, the product life cycle, so life cycle needs to be aligned with the patient life cycle. You know, the, um, Hugo and I may have different opinions as to what device is best for us. One may be concerned with safety, the other may be concerned with performance, but of course we're both concerned with both. It's just our threshold for, you know, picking a device is gonna be different and that needs to be discussed with our healthcare provider. And we can better do that when we have access to the UDI information and know what products are necessarily available on the market and um, how we're gonna make those decisions if there have been recent recalls or so, or um, what is the best performing device. Um, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but just the, <laughs> like the opportunity, yeah. I think there's a great opportunity to make sure there's a patient partnership here and the patient voice is heard what matters most to the patient beyond the recall data, but, you know, tracking the real world data and um, evidence here, just so we can see if there are next generation devices, um, is it worth changing to that, you know, second or third generation, or we're doing just fine with the device we have um, implanted now. Um, it, it, those decisions um, should be co-created as part of the healthcare plan with the healthcare provider and patients. And, you know, being alerted to that information as things change um, would be ideal, I feel, for patients and healthcare providers. Um, and what else? I was thinking of some other things too. Oh yeah, of course, with digital medicine, sensor updates. So I mean, just thinking ahead, you know, if we're not even thinking ahead. These things are already out there. We need to be doing this now. Now's the, the ideal time to be um, putting the work groups together and getting stakeholders involved. Uh, we have about three minutes uh, for question and answer. Well, let me start with, with a question I had previously. Um, what role can, this might, this could probably be for Dennis. What role could provider organizations play in increasing consistent adoption of UDI with suppliers? I think that it's important for healthcare providers to commit to using the unique device identification information that we have. I know there are some great examples 
some of the participants on this call are effectively using UDI and have a vision of how they'd like to use it going forward. And I think we really need to see more of that. It feels like we have a percentage, I don't know exactly what it is, maybe 10%, 20%, something like that of the providers out there are making effective use of UDI or have at least a plan in place where many are doing little or nothing to use this information. I think it's really gonna require a committed use of UDI on the part of the healthcare providers for us to really get value from this. There are lots of complicated questions. I'm trying to find an easy question. I think we're gonna to have to have another panel to, to address these wonderful questions. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me just ask one more question. Um, this will go to Rich Casera. Uh, is there a process for matching the UDI with additional information that might be clinically useful to providers? Uh, thank you, Sherry. Um, yeah, there, there is quite a bit of uh, uh, information uh, that the FDA has amongst its uh, different departments from approval through clearance uh, for what, any of those uh, down to post-market surveillance, including MALD and recalls, uh, all this information can be uh, linked uh, to the UDI uh, to some extent. Uh, that there are issues uh, and gaps in certain places, and it, it would be great um, uh, if, if there were feedback processes in which we could uh, alert the FDA and uh, people submitting the data uh, through these different processes to those gaps so that they could be linked. Um, and, and one thing to, to note on that, to uh, what Angie was talking about earlier, all those pieces of information, uh, healthcare providers also want to know, um, especially in supply chain, which may be surprising to some to hear, but they, they want to be able to compare and understand the differences between these products uh, and use all this different information from where it's manufactured to where it's sterilized, reprocessed, uh, so that they can react to it uh, for their clinicians. And, and also have the details to pass on uh, for, for clinical operations to clinicians themselves um, uh, so that they can in, inform them uh, about these devices. So the, the information is out there. It is uh, able to be linked and matched. Uh, and it would be great if it was all across the board for everything. Thanks, Rich. Um, just one last question um, for Chris and, and Aaron. Uh, how can... You know, adoption of new technology like this um, often has to have regulatory backing. I think uh, that was mentioned by Rich Embry um, in his talk, in his discussion. So are regulatory bodies like FDA and ONC working um, to assist in uh, clinical confusion regarding, for example, the specific case of which barcode to scan during, during a case? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, specifics of how a regulatory body could address some of these um, these differences in interpretation or differences in uh, confusion within the healthcare setting. Start with Chris. Yeah, I mean, I'll go ahead and start anyway. And um, I have a couple of ideas on how this could be handled. Um, you know, based on previous experience, I, I'm not as familiar with um, uh, the labeling that I heard other people talk about today. So some of this might already be addressed there. But one way for an entity that has regulatory authority um, would be to make some kind of a standard regarding the marking of labels and the placement of them so that the barcodes that are to be used are, you know, it's very obvious. Um, and kind of a standardization of the labeling and placement of barcodes. Um, probably a more practical way though, because I know all those devices look differently and they're shaped differently and everything, would um, be for that regulatory agency to develop some educational materials to help people determine um, which barcodes to scan, for example. Um, ONC over the years has developed a variety of um, tools and, and consumer material, education materials that have covered a variety of topics. Um, ONC, for example, um, has worked with the uh, Office of Civil Rights to provide a lot of different materials 
um, educating both providers and patients on HIPAA rights and requirements. We publish documents, web pages, and even YouTube videos in order to um, educate the public. And so that, you know, so those are some ways in which that, that could take place. Okay, thank you. I, we are run, running out of time quickly. Um, so we are gonna follow up with all those questions. Um, I think the MDIC team will collect those for us um, and, and address those after the meeting. Now we're gonna move on from Q&A and close up the session. Uh, first, recognizing that even with all this discussion, we haven't touched on maybe the ice, you know, tip of the iceberg of all the emerging issues, and we don't, I think we all recognize we don't even have the full set of uh, stakeholders um, that would be involved in a full UDI community. But uh, we probably need several days <laughs> and a big room for that. So uh, we've heard a lot of issues around uh, the need for integrating data sources and need for regulatory approval, um, maybe some more education, uh, looking at UDI as a source of truth um, by hospitals, um, the need that patients have that is very similar to hospitals in being able to identify the device and for real world evidence. So we're gonna wrap up by having each of you go through um, one minute. Uh, so I'm gonna have to, I mean, we literally have, uh, I guess, uh, seven minutes left, so we're going to have to be really tight on this. One minute of doable deeds. I think one of the things about a collaborative community is uh, to be action-oriented and um, go beyond just a think tank. So what would you recommend? Um, and we will start with Erin. Quinson. Thanks, Terry. So I appreciated hearing about the key themes and emerging issues in UDI. And FDA's UDI team looks forward to continuing our involvement in MDIC's work as we continue implementing and adopting UDI in the United States. And, you know, we look forward to continuing um, providing educational materials such as guidance documents and other material on our webpage um, to, help, to help those implementing and adopting and trying to make sure they have an understanding and consistent use and application of UDI. Um, so we look forward to the work of this collaborative community and I uh, appreciate everyone coming out to today's event. Thank you, Terry. Thanks so much, Aaron. I'll go back to you, Chris. Yeah, Any so... Um, final okay. thoughts? Yeah, so um, because I'm a regulator, my answers will be a little bit wonky. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, I, I do know, you know, one of the things that was talked about a lot was adoption. I do know, um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a um, CMS payment policy expert. Um, I'm not aware that there is any requirements for providers to document and exchange UDI um, to receive payment other than sharing UDI through ONC certification. Um, I could be wrong and I'd be happy to be proved wrong, but you know, one of the things that are said is, you know, what gets measured and paid for will usually get accomplished. Um, I can't tell CMS what they should be doing or could be doing, but I know that they update their payment policy on a regular cadence. And I encourage people, and, and part of that is, is providing public comments, and I encourage people with ideas related to UDI payment policy to take advantage of those opportunities when they come about and, and provide input into CMS. Um, we work a lot with CMS and they do listen when people give them ideas like that. And then in like manner um, with ONC, um, we have the United States Core Data for Interoperability, which is basically just a standard of um, the baseline data that has to be exchanged through certified technology. Um, we have a current comment period right now that ends um, October 23rd, just a week from tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. And um, I encourage you to take a look at the UCDI. We do have um, UDI represented there, but probably not all the data elements that everyone would want. And so please take a look and provide your feedback. Thank you, Chris. And Dennis. Thank you. I have two actionable items. The first is if we can get regulators to continue to collaborate and make sure that we have harmonization on a global level. We know that the regulation is gonna to continue to be iterative. We're gonna see modest changes as we learn more about this, but to get regulators to where we can make sure that they're um, creating the same rules and the same data structure would be fantastic. The second is I think that 
device manufacturers and healthcare providers have to continue to collaborate. I think we have to accelerate our efforts and we have to work with healthcare providers to make sure they're capable of implementing UDI. If we don't work at this together, we're simply not gonna get the value that we're hoping for. And the idea of public comments as a community is a really, it's a, a really good way to influence policy. As Chris said, Mike Schiller. Thanks, Terry. I'm encouraged by the progress we've made. I remember a few years ago, presenting on the UDI to audiences, and it was deer in the headlights. Nobody, you know, I could have just said DUI, right? It went <laughs> different from that. Uh, so I'm very encouraged by the progress that we've made over the last few years, uh, encouraged by FDA's participation, certainly in each of the Learning UDI community work groups, what uh, FDA's participation in MDIC. And I just encourage us, as Dennis said, we need to get all the proper stakeholders around the table. We need to continue these collaboration efforts and we need to clear the hurdles that each of us have identified today and really look at what's the best way to clear those hurdles so that we can go ahead and continue to promote UDI consumption, adoption and consumption within the clinical healthcare supply chain, as well as the procedural settings and patient care settings. Thank you, Mike. Rich, Kusera. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Uh, I, I guess two closing uh, remarks I'd like to say is first and foremost, um, uh, building a global uh, source of data for everything we're doing here uh, with the UDI uh, requires a speed of iteration and feedback. Um, there are millions of people looking at this data in different ways and harnessing and using that, those insights in a formal manner uh, with all parties involved, including regulators, manufacturers, hospitals, patients, uh, et cetera, payers. Um, that, that is cr critical to make this uh, all work. And then to build on top of that, as these uh, regulations come up in uh, additional countries, the, the nuances and differences are really looking at what happened at Good ID and building on top of them. And, and so, in fact, we should be looking at those as uh, signs of feedback on how to enhance things, since at the end of this, this should be one global harmonized data set that everyone's speaking uh, the same language with. Um, so. This will require building out more standards, uh, especially as you look into sizes and features and attributes. Um, standards are critical, um, and to make those requires feedback. Thank you. Uh, Rich Embry. Yeah, thanks, Terry. I, th I think two comments. One, as a provider, as a, as a clinician, uh, I'm excited about the amount of the potential of UDI and the amount of information that you can gain from a single discrete data field. Uh, to help care for one of your patients is just very exciting and fantastic. But I also see the same problem with UDI that we have with EHR, which is the cost of implementation is borne not by the people who benefit from it. And so I think the entire community uh, needs to really look at how can we make sure that implementation of UDI moves forward and how can we do that in a collaborative way. Thank you so much. Angie. Any final thoughts? Oh, yeah. um, just again to rem remember that, you know, patients are at the table and thought of as partners in this whole process. Um, I was thinking that not just the patient real world data, they can have more comprehensive data. One of the questions and um, well, not answered yet, but one of the questions and from the audience member was including the patient generated data. So you're gonna, again, you know, thank you for reminding us of that. Um, you're gonna get more comprehensive data. So it goes beyond just the pivotal perfect trial patient that meets all the inclusion exclusion criteria. We'll get real world data, real world evidence, patient generated data to see how it works in those patients with comorbidities that might not have been included in their original clinical trial or so. So beyond clinical research, now we're going into active surveillance and all to see what, which particular manufacturer um, manufacturer's device or so works best in which patient cohorts and that sort of thing with the real world data. So thank you um, to Heidi Dose or so for reminding us of that as well. Thank you for pulling that out. Thanks. Uh, you, you go, you are the closer and you have uh, one minute for your <laughs> final comments. All I need is 30 seconds. I'm going to piggyback on, <laughs> I'm going to piggyback on Angie's comments. Uh, I, I think it's really important. Let's get the UDI in, in the electronic health record so that uh, patients can, can have the choice to share that with, uh, with programs like the All of Us, not to bring it up again, but I'm really proud of being a, a part of it. It's a, such a, 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 a major 
uh, public health investment, uh, taxpayer money, a, a million residents of the United States, a 10 year long program, uh, really ambitious and incredible program. And, uh, but we don't have data like the UDI in there. Uh, there is a diversity of data types, uh, EHR data, biospecimens, uh, even, even uh, data from, uh, from patient generated data of uh, surveys and uh, uh, from collected from mobile devices and, and a variety of uh, data sources but no UDI. So we, 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 and this is a, again, a missed opportunity. And I think the future is bright for us in a sense that, that if, we, if we check all these boxes and if we, if we do the right things um, and, uh, and uh, add the, uh, the UDI to the, uh, to the patient record, make it a part of the, the, the patient's core health data, we should be, be able to generate valuable data sets that are specific to certain populations, which is the essence of the all of us being uh, all about diversity. And so that we can access real world data that, that can answer questions about device performance uh, yeah. for people with uh, different conditions in a variety of different populations. We got through a tremendous amount of issues and discussion in a short amount of time. I appreciate all of you. We need to hand this over now to the MDIC team. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, everyone. Um, we are really excited about what's in store, about the conversations and progress that we'll be making. We really value your voice on this subject, and clearly, um, as evidence today, there's an appetite for more conversation. Um, so we will work to make that happen with additional events, such as today's, and asynchronous electronic responses to your thoughtful questions. I'll remind you of how to get involved and stay connected with us, as you see on the screen. First, as a Nest Collaborative Community member. Um, second, by applying to serve on the UDI Project Advisory Working Group. And third, please do follow us on social media. And so on behalf of Nest and the Nest Collaborative Community and MDIC, I wish you a great rest of the afternoon and thank you again for being here. Bye-bye. <laughs>